morning. So thank you guys for all joining. Uh, my name is Nicole Yembra. I'm the founder, managing director of the Chrysalis Company. Um, basically, I just have two sides of my business. One, One side, side helps invest in early stage technology, technology startups, startups like I said, just like I hope watching, watching you watch and watch start creating. The other side, and the other side, really really side is the advisory, advisory and helping you your take early your early tech, early tech, tech ideas, ideas and African, 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 African and also kind of spread out across the globe. So thank you, so for, thank you for joining us for this third edition of the Tech Campus that we're doing this online and digitally, which is perfect. That is the top of our panel of our panel today is on the information. Information. So, so super happy that we're having this really and we hope that we're able to, that we're able to share some information, share some information, information with you, learn a lot, learn a lot, learn a lot, learn a lot and, um, and, 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 and we are really excited, excited about how to transform, transform our, continent. our continent. So now, I'm now I would love to, now I would love to um, introduce um, my fellow, fellow cast member, um, <laughs> um, uh, our kind of tech. I kind of worked my way into this panel, but these three amazing gentlemen, they have been living and breathing technology and advising governments on it for years so you know can't wait for you to hear from them first, so first, first um, 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 I, I have Mr. Kone. 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 he's executive, executive director, director general, general. and CEO of Smart Africa, Africa. Um, um, he's advisor to the prime, prime minister of the Republic of Guatemala and also, and also and targeted, targeted the transformation of public forum for the president as well so welcome to Kone I also have the House of Habits and regional director for the International Telecommunications Union and basically driving a lot a lot of you know push around IC, which is a huge part and layer for digital transformation. So welcome, sir. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Oscar Mondo, um, who's an entrepreneur leader in the African tech space. He's currently serving as Director General of GitGay, Equatorial Guinea, and Fiber Optic Infrastructure Manager. He's extremely, extremely passionate about uh, ICT and SSA, and obviously he's a huge part of supporter and reason why we're here today. So thank you so much thank um, you for, for having joining me. us. Now, now when we talk about you know digital, I want to you know read this kind of this quote from a report <coughs> that an MIT about what digital transformation will do for Africa before I open up. The Basically, says the digital internet age is presenting major opportunities in the development space in the 21st century. In every single sector, technology is disrupting the status quo, from financial access to property rights from health to education, from energy to services, measurement of outcomes, implementation methods, and ways to connect stakeholders like never before. For the first time in human history, we can theoretically connect to every single stakeholder. Technology can exponentially facilitate the achievement of development goals through rapid scale, and hopefully also provide dividends for the world's poorest people. Now, the focus here today is about what digitization and how we kind of harness this for the future. So, what does digitization mean? So, I'll start with Mr. Conan. Like, what when I say digitization, what is what am I even talking about? What does that mean? All these concern about. Well, uh, thank you very much to to really respond. Thank you very much for inviting me and. Uh, I appreciate the invitation from uh, Tech Campus, and it's been really an honor to be here uh, to be sharing ideas uh, today on the video conference. Well, digitization, I, I think if you social distancing rule uh, across the world today, with the fact that we need to continue to work, we need to get to continue to learn, we need to continue to to do whatever we're doing by keep while keeping a social distancing. That is basically digitization. It means anything we need to do on a conventional basis, we are carrying it online. I like to characterize it in this way. With the digital trust, nothing will end. The only thing that will remain constant is the world change itself. Otherwise, everything will change. For me, that's the digitization. I love the, the simple response is nothing will stay the same. And it's, it is an example of social distancing. I love that. Mr. Andrew, how about for you? What does digitization mean to you? Um, thank you. I also thank you. Uh, thank, thank my friend Oscar for the invitation. Uh, and also congratulate uh, the partner uh, take together. Uh, it is really, really uh, uh, 
a big, a step, big step, step in the right direction, the right direction, direction for different reasons. reasons. One, because one, because one, it's fully digital, it's fully digital but, but two, because, but two it's, because young, it's young people. So, so, <coughs> so, 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 digitization. digitization. I assumed, I assumed that you were asking, asking digitization, digitization uh, uh, in the framework, in the framework or, 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 or the two uh, words, the two words, words that we usually, usually interchange, interchange digitization, digitization and digitalization. And digitalization. And, 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 the, and the, the definition, definition, the definition, the definition that, that I would give, give of digitization is making everything that, that we do uh, put it, putting it in a format that we can use it digitally. Uh, if you take a uh, voice for text, anything, anything, that, you anything can, that you can, can, you can, you can reformat, reformat, digitize, digitize and, 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 and make, make, make use, use of them, them with them digital, digital devices. devices. More fundamental, more fundamental well, however, is digitalization, is digitalization which, which I take uh, to be the really the adoption and mainstreaming of the uh, whatever we do into our daily lives now uh, what uh, uh, latina <coughs> just referred to uh, nothing has brought home uh, that or or that concept than covid itself because now we nobody is allowed to pay in cash right you use uh, digital money. Uh, Nobody is allowed to be near anybody. You call them. We are not allowed to go to meetings like this. We use video conference. So that that is, in my view, uh, what it is. Why I think your article um, mentioned so much uh, that is in the direction that go back is because digitization and digitalization uh, brings efficiency, bring, brings precision, brings, uh, brings you nearer to each other. So it, it's got so many attributes that it wouldn't make sense to go back on. I love that. I love that. Uh, focusing again on digitalization. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I would like to first of all uh, uh, appreciate uh, the presence of uh, Mr. Lassina for, for being part of Tech Campus. Thank you very much. It's an honor uh, for having you in this event. And uh, also Mr. Andrew as well. I'm very happy and uh, honored to, for having you as well in, the, in this third edition of Tech Campus Online. I think, as I said, uh, as you, you well said, Nicole, digitalization has uh, already been described by uh, Mr. Lesina and Andrew. But from my perspective, uh, is the adoption of new technologies in uh, our everyday life. I will just give an example, which is the obvious one. Uh, I know we have the COVID, but let me just use the Tech Campus example. You know, Tech Campus has been run as a physic physically uh, from, from the first and second edition. And this year, Tech Campus, it was, uh, we were going to have it physically. But due to what happened, we started, it gave us another opportunity to innovate, to think in new ways of doing the same thing, but virtual, adopting new technologies uh, to, to produce the same quality of event to produce this smile from, uh, uh, to the young people, which is what Tech Campus is about. So we came with this uh, uh, virtual platform. We decided to organize uh, Tech Campus online and uh, to adopt this new way of living, uh, which I think uh, it might last maybe for a year or two until we find uh, uh, a vaccine. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to me, it is uh, uh, adopting new ways of uh, in technology. Yeah. No, I love it. Those are those are all really great, you know, responses. And I hope for those of you that are, are watching, you're starting to internalize, right? What does this mean? So we actually say tech. That sounds fantastic. But what does it actually mean? So now you have concrete definitions about the fact that it impacts how you pay, it impacts how you study, it impacts how you learn, you know, it impacts how you attend conferences like this. So it's really now a part of our everyday life. 
Now, when you say technology, people immediately think Silicon Valley. That's the immediate reaction to technology and, you know, what is cutting edge, where everyone gets to be big, that's where the funding is. Um, so now, though, if we're to ask you guys, do you think we could be an African Silicon Valley? Right. So, what what would it take? When do we think we can see an Africa Silicon Valley, or will Silicon Valley always be the only one? So, you know, Mr. Andrew, I'll I'll take it to you first. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> now, I could argue with you and say define Silicon Valley, this and this and this and the other, but I'm not. I'm an optimist. I believe I believe that we shall see not one, but several Silicon Valleys in, in, in Africa at the rate uh, that uh, our young people, our young entrepreneurs, at the rate at which they are going, the rate at which they are adopting emerging technologies, I believe uh, we shall see a Silicon Valley or two. Uh, in, when you consider really uh, what our young people are doing, what our, our governments are waking up to. You have um, digital cities springing up, you have innovation apps springing up, you have, so everything is coming together. And there isn't a single day when flights to Africa are devoid of people who are coming to look at Africa, uh, trying to look for the ideas of our young people. That must be something. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come hunting if there was nothing here. So what is it going to take to actually have uh, a type of Silicon Valley? One, we need to have an enabling environment. We need to have our governments, our regulators, recognize the value of uh, our young people's ideas. And so what are we doing in ITU? We actually have started uh, working with governments in uh, creating uh, uh, their digital innovation ecosystems that are an all of government endeavor and all of business sector endeavor. And when I say that, I, I mean the Ministry of Health is in it, the uh, company that is in our business is in it. Everybody is coming together to uh, to, to to nurture this uh, innovation ecosystem and to nurture the young people that are actually going to innovate within this system. Okay. Thank you. I like the response. You you got me to my next question. But I'm going to let everyone kind of talk about this a bit more. I definitely want to, to dive into public sector and private sector's role in digitization, but I'll come to that next. Um, so, Oscar, what do you think? Do you think that we, we will have an African Silicon Valley? What do you think it'll, it'll take? Do you think it's even something we should aspire to at all? Sorry, can you repeat, Nicole? Couldn't hear very well, please. Sure. Yes, sure. I said, so what do you think it would take for us to have our own African Silicon Valley? Or is it even something we want to aspire to? Um, you know, what are the kind of components to having an African Silicon Valley? Okay, yeah, I got it. Um, I think, Nicole, when you look at the speed in which uh, new technology are being adopted here in Africa is tremendous. Young people uh, are getting online more and more. We have more African population that are connected. And that's obvious that we will definitely have a Silicon Valley. We are having startups. The number of startups in Africa just keep growing and growing. But to me, what I really think that will enable this uh, Silicon Valley to come up um, is, uh, as uh, Mr. Andrew said, is the, to make sure that government produce the right regulation to, for, so that we have we have all this investment that is needed here in Africa, and also I think the university, they play a big role in uh, this type of ecosystem. Because obviously we need uh, human resources, people that are well trained to carry out uh, this ecosystem. But regulation being okay. a very uh, important part of it. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Mr. Sina. 
what what are your thoughts on African Silicon Valley? <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the idea of a Silicon Valley isn't about really a location or a place. Uh, for me, Silicon Valley is already here. For Africa, we have our own uniqueness and what we need to build. I believe the African Silicon Valley is already on the way and we have made a tremendous progress in five major areas, namely skills and capacity building, which means developing relevant digital skills. An example of that, if Africa was a United States, the way we created the mobile money was created in Africa, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same the way it was treated like the way it is now. Look at this. This is a real revolution. Yep. There are some people, they never had a bank account in their life, but they have a mobile money account. It is not happening anywhere in, in, in the world. The second thing is the innovation and entrepreneurship, creating an environment where new ideas flourish. Talking about innovation entrepreneurship, which is actually led by young people, Africa is the only continent with over 800 million population less than 30 years old. Mm -hmm. The third thing is the collaboration. The collaboration being able to bring ideas from different places, people together for a common goal. We have it. Uh, an example of that is our collaboration, Smart Africa, with the ITU, with the AU, yep. with the development partners, GSS, GSS, and so on and so forth. Policy, uh, the number four, the policy having the right harmonized policy in place to encourage collaboration, innovation, and the flow of the capital and erupt the huge benefit of close to 1.3 billion economy. And the number five of that it will be the right digital infrastructure on which all the above will actually run on it. So, talking about Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley is already here. I love it. I love that response. Um, <laughs> it's it's very very nice. to... Yes, sure, Mr. I, I, would, I, would, I would like to add to that because um, I, I, I think when you bring all that together, you need critical mass of users, yes. correct? And so uh, accessibility and affordability are key issues uh, that that need to be in the, in that mix. Mm. That these guys can, can can develop, they can collaborate, they can have the right technologies. Unless we market, mm -hmm. if it's success is going to be very difficult. So uh, accessibility and affordability, having having even devices that you can afford uh, is a very important thing yeah i mean all of you made it, 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 really excellent I, points. go ahead mr Lucina. but i i like to jump in you know what just andrew said which is the mass today we all talk about china which owns 40 percent of investments in africa mainly in infrastructure we all talk about china what made the power of china it is a 1.5 billion market yeah. yep. with a unique voice where the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is on its way for that. It's a 1.3 billion mark, 1.5 billion mark. Africa is 1.3. Yep. Literally speaking, it means Africa has a capability to create a billionaire unicorn every day. You know how? Yeah by just developing an application used by mm. Africans sold for a dollar. Exactly. Absolutely. So yeah. Silicon Valley is already here, but we just don't see it, but we have to be able to see it in the context of Africa. Thank you. Yes, I love it, I love it. So what you guys talked a lot about, again, was enabling environment what the government has to do, you know, the fact that we really do operate as 54 different countries versus being one powerful African bloc. Now, my next question is, what do you see as the role of, or who's more important? And I want a percentage. I'm gonna force you to give me a percentage. Is it public sector or private sector? Is it 50, 50, is it 59, you know, and 41? Like what is, I want a percentage 
to know who is going to be at the core of driving digitization. Because like you said, we have policy, we have devices we need to get out, we have to make sure it's affordable, we have to make sure we're interconnected, we have to make sure people are educated. Who is the primary responsibility between public sector and private sector in pushing us towards, you know, harnessing the full potential of our Silicon Valley? And so I'll let whoever wants to jump <laughs> well, no, no. in. No, Andrew, 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 you go first, Andrew. <laughs> all right, so, all right. I, I think they, they both, private sector and public sector, have a big role. But let's look. In Africa, our private sector is still very low. Uh, what I was talking about, the, the thing that is going to bring them up is first of all giving them a good environment in which to work, allow them to uh, developing a, a, a market. This market that we were talking about, uh, Africa developing that market and create, creating a critical mass, that's going to be important. Whose role is that? Government. One is government, one is business. So I would Give start a at... I, I would start at I would start at uh, government being sixty percent, right? To start business forty percent, they meet and business surpasses when everything is in place. Okay. All right, we got we've got one number on the board, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <Lucina. laughs> Okay, the, you know, I, I, I agree with Andrew, however, the 60% responsibility on the government rely pretty much more on the 40%. I will tell you why. Okay. Mm -hmm. The private sector drive the innovation. When we talk about leapfrogging, when we talk about leapfrogging, the technology innovation comes from the private sector then the government need to adapt the law to be able to promote that. Simple example. If Safaricom had to wait for the regulation of Kenya to be able to launch the M-Pesa as a mobile money, the mobile money will never see the world today. <laughs> yep. So it's very tricky. Then the 60% pillar responsibility on the government, it's very true because government need enabling environment. In the context of Africa, that enabling environment has to be harmonized. As Andrew said, the private sector is very small in Africa, true, but the innovation is driven by the private sector. Then regulation comes, if you remember back in the days, 10, 15 years ago, in the telecom sector, the telecom sector licenses in every country, it used to be given based on the name of the technology you are going to do. X25, ISDL, frame relay. But they were never able to catch up because technology is changing so much and so rapidly. Now they have to give a universal license. We do not care what technology you deploy. That's how the adaptive the government should be in actually updating the regulation to be able to assist the innovation driven by the private sector. I love that. So we're still we're uh, two people say 60 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think I agree I agree with what uh, just uh, uh, Mr. Lesina said. Uh, the uh, I would get I would I would just give you a very good example which is uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea. You look at it, uh, three years ago, we didn't, we didn't have tech campus, we didn't have uh, some incubators here. But we, now, we are now starting to have incubator thanks to the realization of tech campus first edition 2018. The government did not have laws for that. Exactly. They didn't have laws for that. But we couldn't wait, as uh, Mr. Lesina said, uh, with a very good example, which is Mpesa. The first edition, the government didn't pay much attention, but the second one, we had everyone all over from the government. 
And then we now started to have incubators, and now the government started worrying, well, we now need to create law because this, they cannot work like this. We now need to create law to motivate and incentivate these incubators and young entrepreneurs. So that means that the private sector is the one that is really driving uh, uh, the, the, the innovation. innovation. But the government needs to create a good platform so that this ecosystem can keep on growing. I will stick with the 60-40, but they both depend upon on each other. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I actually want to counter. I, I, I want to give an example. Uh, yes. Athena, I, I, totally, I totally agree. But um, there, there, there was private sector that, that, that was tangible in Kenya, right? I want yes. to ask you, how many, how many countries actually have uh, a successful uh, money system? And I can quote a country that I know that yes. is very big, right? It is only allowing, um, uh, allowing businesses, telcos to actually run mobile money. It is extremely important where the government stands in supporting, uh, in supporting uh, business to even thrive and to, to give them an environment where, uh, where they uh, uh, do business like, like we're talking about. But another thing is that uh, in many places in the rural Africa, connectivity is a problem. There is there's, uh, digital connectivity, but there is also roads, right, to actually be able to move freely in, in the country, even to, to go and put, put up towers in places. There are places where it's impossible because, because there are no roads. So yeah. it, it is, there is a big role of government in laying infrastructure, putting policy and regulation in in, in, in and I should say, now at ITU, we are promoting a light touch inclusive regulation. regulation. Uh, so that, that will allow, allow, put regulation in place, but give elbow room to businesses to operate. Yeah, very true. It's very true because, uh, as you said, in rural area, we do have, you know, I think on average, you know, I don't have the correct statistics. We have uh, close to 60% of African population living in rural area. In some rural area, there are people living there, and there are no roads. But the telecom need to get there. Sometimes the telecomers are not there. But again, talking about that, the reason why 60 is really true, because they cannot be balanced 50-50. For one reason, I call it social contract. <laughs> the population signed a social contract with governments to take care of them. It is the responsibility of the government to have the infrastructure in place. Same. While the private, yes, you see, the social contract, <clears throat> the people forget about a lot. The private sector is the profit driven. And you can see that if it was not profit driven, how come until now in Africa there's only 39% broadband penetration? Mm -hmm. compared to 51 percent around the world yeah so that's why a lot of weight has to go to the government because of the social contract between the population and the government to do the right thing so your your responses is are why i actually say 75 percent government and 25 percent <laughs> private sector because if i have to generate my own power i have to fix my own roads i have to you think you know all of the educate my own children when do i have time to start innovating and the energy and money to start doing that so in a lot of other countries innovation can happen faster right because the infrastructure is there and a system of identification right so how do we even count all of these people which you guys both brought up you know populations in rural parts of, of our country which is a huge part of africa now how can we you know get them to be digitally literate right how can digital literacy you know help bring more people because we're sitting here we have our skype ids 
and our Zoom, and we have all it's it's natural to us. We've had smartphones for ages, but there's a whole lot of people in our different countries that are not yet quite digitally literate. So how do we ensure that we don't continue to create these gaps between those that that understand and are being included and the vast population that's rural that are not is this literacy training help like what are the the ideas to ensure that we bring the whole continent forward and so i would let me oscar i always have you talk last you want to jump first <laughs> coming to uh, infrastructure first for example, what is happening uh, uh, in Hitre, what we are doing is to lay down all the telco infrastructure, mainly fiber, which we have uh, covered almost 80% uh, of it all over. It's the government that is paying for it. But one thing that is happening uh, as well, while the government is uh, paying for, for the infrastructure, you will still have some operators, some companies that are not willing to give services in rural areas because of profit. Even though this infrastructure is not being laid down by them, it's being laid down by the government. This situation, we have it here, uh, just coming what uh, Mr. Lesina was saying, that is the government uh, that needs to lay down the infrastructure. Well, we are doing that here. We are doing the towers, we are doing the fiber optics all around rural area, but we still have some companies that we don't know, they're not willing to give their services to these some rural areas. So coming to the literacy side, I think we, people have to start using technology before they can be digitally literate. And by providing them uh, uh, this infrastructure like smartphone, smart tablet that are accessible in price and also giving them programs, uh, e-learning, programs, which uh, uh, as far as it's concerned here in, uh, in, in Guinea, due to the, the COVID, the university has started, uh, they have started doing that, that uh, they're providing the e-learning platform for those people that are mostly in need in rural areas and uh, different programs that are being run online and all, all sorts of things. I love that. Okay, um, Mr. Lucina. Thank you very much. Digital literacy well, and the, and the yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will first of all, I will, I will give an answer to. Well, he didn't ask a question, but I will. I will give him a piece of information that will help him. The private sector is driven is driven by profit. Yes. We all know that. That is a that is the heart of capitalism. The way other countries solve that problem, where the private service provider you do not want to go to specific reality because of profitability. What the government need to do, the government need to democratize the service. What does that mean, democratize? Young entrepreneur, young businessman in those villages, in those rural area, make accessible the license to become an ISP, local ISP. You will see that in France, when you go to South France, if you go to Montpellier or you go to Marseille, the ISP, the internet service provider you find in south of France, could be different from the one who's in the capital in Paris or even in Toulouse. Why? Because they want to create jobs. They know that those big companies, they don't want to go to areas where they cannot make money. So the government needs to ease up the rules and the regulation and law to be a retailer of the internet services. And those big companies who do not want to go to the rural area, they become the wholesaler. So it's the win-win and it creates a job. So talking about now closing the gap, there are three or four categories we are facing today for Africa to be able to live from. We have people who have never been to school. We have people who've been to school, but they are not digitalized. They are not ICT focused. And we have people who are ICT focused. You see this? You said something very important. People have to be able to use the technology without being educated in technology. I love that. You know why? 1.5 billion population in China. Do the Chinese speak English, all of them? No, they do not. How come they are advanced? 
They are advanced because of the artificial intelligence. Mm. Today, you and I, we all use iPhone or we use Samsung. The iPhone use series. The series use in or French language or state or Spanish language. Who said so? <laughs> Who said so? Who said so? It means young people today in the area, in the country where I live in Rwanda, they are developed, they're working on artificial intelligence to be able to talk in Kina Rwanda to a phone and they will say in a local language, send 100 friends to my grandmother and the machine should be able to do it. It means you're allowing non-educated people, you are using artificial intelligence as a technology to allow them to use then get the benefit of technology without going to school. But we traditionally in Africa, we think someone will come from outside and tell us what to do. I keep on telling the young people, Mark Zuckerberg will never come to Africa to tell us what to do. Our future is in our own hand. And we are as smart as everyone around this world. And we are many. We are 800 million, less than 30 years old. So talking about closing digital gap, we must face the truth. The educational, traditional educational system in Africa, it is a failure. I will be very honest, because why is it a failure? While other nations are trying to go to the moon, we are still producing people with a bachelor and master's degree in history. <laughs> <laughs> No. While people are thinking of going to the moon, we are producing, we are producing, all of us here, we've done the history at school. We've done the geography. Today with the Google and Google Earth, I can travel in the space and virtually and literally know countries I've never been before that the traditional geography cannot teach me that at school. Sure. It means we need educational reform. One thing. Educational reform is for people who are still as graduated for a job. Because you know why? The statistics show that close to 85% of the job in 2030 has not been created yet. The job in 10 years, 85% of the job in 30 years, in, 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 in the 10 years, 2030, have not been created. So how do we face that? So we need to change education for people who are still at school. People who are going to work, they need a vocational training for skills in ICT and how to use it. People who are not educated at all, we should use the technology such as artificial intelligence and other technology to be able to allow them to use technology without being a technical set. That's what I have to say. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Andrew. Over to you. So again, on and the divide. Like I'm, I have all these notes here. Like I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I love this. So, Mr. Andrew, over to you. Lassina, you're not speaking before me again. <laughs> but I, I, I totally, totally agree. I totally agree that we need to think differently. I agree that being uh, digital literate, uh, 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 even if you do not have any other uh, education, is important. But I, I, since I agree with all those, let me tell you what some of the things that rest the problem. Um, you are you are talking about being able to do things. This. These guys go to Google and do things. These guys go to the internet and do things. Our kids do not have a means to be guided to even do that, right? How many schools in Africa are actually connected to the internet? Few. Very, Very few. few. Very few. So, um, and uh, UNICEF have come up with this humongous project called that we are calling Giga. 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 Giga like big, like gigabytes. And it's actually 
basically supposed to deliver gigabytes school in the world, connect every school to the internet, connect every child to opportunity and choice. Now, what, what this actually means is that uh, somewhere in the middle of uh, Burkina Faso or in the middle of uh, Equatorial Guinea where you are, uh, Oscar, the child needs to grow up with the culture of educating themselves with a little guidance from somebody, but they can go and explore this big, wide world of the internet. And this is what this, this project is going to achieve. Uh, and because one of the drawbacks uh, or one of the barriers in putting infrastructure in place, all these barriers that we've been talking about, is money. So we have come up with a different approach, a different model for financing this humongous project. And we are calling this a common uh, a, a, a public. So how do we do that? We get uh, a group of countries in Africa. We get Nigeria, for example, a populous country with money, but without connectivity in some places. <laughs> then we get. Not Nigerian, Nigeria, so, <laughs> you know what you have to say about my country. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then we've got uh, maybe uh, Cameroon, which doesn't have the money, doesn't have the connectivity, right? more countries like that right Bring those countries together the market is huge and therefore private sector investors should be able to say i cannot invest in cameroon around and i cannot invest in cameroon and maybe rwanda but i can invest in cameroon rwanda nigeria maybe something else because the market is big the investment is guaranteed government uh, giving some guarantees to these to these investments and achieve connectivity of schools now the other thing in in africa when you look at africa and the setup where you have a, you have a hospital or you have a, a clinic or community center you have a government office all those are together so you invest just a school Right? That connectivity is now available to the bigger community around the school. Now, um, another thing that, that, that I think is addressing this problem is that uh, the education system that, that uh, Lassina was talking about, I agree, is totally wrong. Right? I have people, and I'm not talking about myself because I'm too old, but even the young ones started, started touching computers when they were at university. How do you expect this mind to turn around and be innovative digitally? Mm -hmm. So we need to start from the beginning, from, every, from the first day they step into school, you need to have ICTs on the table. Right? The other thing that, and we are doing this in the framework of a project that is actually uh, um, an, a gender equality project called African Girls Can Code. Why we think we solve the problem of girls that are of age, are going to university, don't have these skills, we are solving that. But we are also following up and saying we need to influence these governments, they need to change the education system, they need for boys and girls equally to have that ICT education from the beginning. So, I see that you're right, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think since we still need politicians, we need historians. No, I totally agree with you. We are also supporting the Giga project. It's very true. I mean, you know, the we may be able to control our generation, but let me tell you one thing. Let me tell all of you. Try to take your kids and think you go on a vacation, maybe north of Nigeria or south of Nigeria. Once you get into the hotel, before you, before you even check in, 
the kids will be asking what's a Wi-Fi code. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know what does you know what that mean? It means the mass law hierarchy that we all been taught at school, which is basic need self actualization. Today, our gen this young generation, they're imposing a sub layer, which is called Wi-Fi first before the food. Yes. Yes. Mm. <laughs> even during <laughs> even during dinner. <laughs> yeah. 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 So and uh, so. Yeah, Mr. Andrew, you, you brought up something that is actually very near and dear to me, actually. When you, we talked about the divide and we said, you know, those, there's three layers of, of people that are educated around, like what Mr. Lucina said, but you brought up gender, which I think we can't talk about technology, we can't talk about digitization without talking about our already existing gender gap in terms of education, in terms of accessibility. You know, Africa has, like various African countries have the world's highest number of female entrepreneurs, but yet funding is almost non-existent, right? Black women get less than 0.1% of, of funding for their businesses, no matter how entrepreneurial, no matter how much they're, they're growing, you know, the different businesses in the countries. So when we're talking about digitization, what efforts do we have to make specifically to ensure that women and young girls are not left behind? I know we talk about coding programs, that's great, but fundamentally, <laughs> education, right? Fundamentally, like policy or any of those things, I would love to hear the thoughts from you guys, you know, since you brought, since you brought it up, Mr. Andrew, how do we ensure that women and, gen and girls specifically are not left behind? Um, I was actually speaking at um, some some event recently and I think gender gap is at different levels. There is the gender gap that we are now struggling with, there is the gender gap that will come up when my who is uh, 18 is growing up, there is the one that will come up when my son who is 2. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that the education, uh, the education is not is not for only certain people. It's for everybody, especially the young boys and young girls, because they are the ones that grow up in different directions. That's number one. Number two, this social contract we have with the government, it is not part of the population that has social contract with the government. The government needs to look at after men and women, girls and boys. And therefore, they need, the governments need to put in place really, really efficient rules. And I know my country, Rwanda, has put in really stringent rules. And guess what? People are following them. So it's not that people don't want to follow. It's that governments are in putting this in place. So in, 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 in addition to uh, uh, quick wins of teaching, <coughs> teaching young girls the skills that they need, the digital skills, to be able to get into the market, we need to teach this at a very young age, at a non-discriminatory level, where the boys and girls, are, they not feel the same, right? Start school. We need to work on policies that address this issue of damage disparity, right? And we actually need to put money down. Yeah. We, 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 can't, we can't be looking at a project, an innovative project, and we are, we, we are fine. And first of all, look at, look at the name, look at the gender. Right? Because <laughs> I know this happens. <laughs> I know this I, I also I also know that this happens when we are we are recruiting, right? Mm -hmm. When you are recruiting, I, I, I'm talking. Oh, does she have a master's degree? Or does she have a master's degree? But then you come down. Uh, is this a boy or a woman? Is it a boy or a girl? Thinking must stop. I keep telling people: Look how far Africa has come in terms of development, right? But we have reached here with literally only half the population because yeah. minimize the other gender. Can you imagine 
how far ahead we would be if girls were participating fully in this digital transformation. Yes. I love it. I love it. Oscar, remember this. Fund women when I come to you. Remember that. Okay? Remember that. Remember that conversation. Okay? <laughs> your thoughts. Your thoughts on this. Well, I think is um, in the African perspective, I think it's uh, the mentality, the way of uh, looking at a woman. Be sorry, because if we look and say, okay, as uh, Mr. Andrews, you just gave a good example when you're hiring, uh, you say, okay, well, who is this is a woman? No, we don't want a woman. We want a, a guy, an engineer. It's just the way of we African, we are thinking. For us, for example, at Hitre, over 50 percent of uh, employee, employees are women. Are women because it's not because they are better than men. Because we we are promoting, we are making sure that women as men they have the same kind of opportunity when we are hiring them. Because from the start, let's be honest, at home, in the African uh, uh, perspective. The way we are being educated most of the time when it comes to women, it's not the same way a man will be educated. This still happens in most, in most countries here in Africa, where they will say, you know what, you're a woman, you're not supposed to be doing this, or you're not supposed to be touching this iPad or doing this. Ah, yes, you're a man. You're going to be an engineer. You have to be a pilot. Yes, you're going to have an iPad. All these things is just the way of, our way of thinking. We need to change our approach. Our approach needs to change. We need to make sure that women and men, they have the same opportunities. We have to provide, as uh, Nicole just said, yes, I uh, will find you when you come. We have to find. <laughs> <laughs> but as you're giving me the final word, I want you to think about which sectors do you think are being managed well digitally and which ones do you think are being managed, you know, poorly and have an opportunity? So, you know, give a final word on, on this topic, but really which sectors from, you know, from FinTech to education to agriculture, government, health, energy, utilities, the, you know, technology and digitization is affecting all of these sectors. Which ones do you think are being managed well? And which ones do you think there's an opportunity to, to really do more? So, Oscar, I'll start with you. Then, Mr. Andrew, go to you, and we'll finish with you, Ms. Nicole, Nicole, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> sure. Which sectors um, do you feel are being managed well digitally? So, <coughs> sectors like FinTech or finance, you know, agriculture, power, governance. If, which of these sectors do you think are being managed best digitally? Or which, or which sectors do you think could use a lot more improvement in terms of making digitalization part of, of the everyday operations of that mm -hmm. sector? I think when it comes to uh, uh, the finance part, I think it's being managed very well digitally. And uh, we can, I think we can say we need, uh, in Africa, we need more improvement when it comes to uh, uh, agri-tech, the, uh, the agriculture side of it. Because we are, as we are seeing, we see how uh, the use of uh, technology in agriculture is helping a lot of farmers. And this need to, we need to create more and more uh, uh, ways of using technology in this uh, area. Awesome. So FinTech, digital finance, agriculture, and health. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Um, Am I, am I allowed to say none of these? <laughs> yes, you can take out any of them. You can take any sector. You can, you can say which, which ones are the worst. Which ones need the most help? <laughs> they, they, they are all not very well managed. Really what I'm trying to say is that opportunities are everywhere. Yeah. These are in FinTech, in agriculture, in education. The, what I would say is is missing for them to thrive is they have no framework or no ecosystem the ecosystem the innovation ecosystem i was talking about because you that uh has uh an innovation in in uh, uh agro, agro tech and 
the, 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 the central bank uh, or the bank is not backing them because they don't see the, 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 the value. So creating this ecosystem of support between where knows what health is doing and what, what is needed, where they know what education is doing, coming together and actually designing and allowing young people to thrive is what is Africa win. There is yeah. an approach. Yesterday, we launched uh, Smart Villages Blueprint. And what that is, the one that we have piloted in Niger, is we were saying in Africa, the rural, the rural uh, uh, people are a lot more than people living in, in urban areas. In Niger, it is 95%. So the, yeah. the, the answer that we found is being able to go to the villages and create smart villages there and have all these sectors actually engage from that point of view because people can grow food, so help them agriculture. People need help, yeah. so help them with that. And we are bringing almost all the UN agencies together, all the NGOs together to look at this concept because we are not going to have only cities enable digital awesome so mr Sina, i'm gonna get put you on the spot and you know what are we doing well what can we do better in in different sectors here yeah thank you very much uh yes as uh Oscar said uh fintech africa is doing very good in fintech we see they have the three capitals jobo nairobi lagos fighting for funds every year I can see that the fintech coming from the mobile money, you know, was quite a success. But where I see as a smart Africa that we need to be focusing on, there is a saying, ignorance is worse than the poverty. Mm. <laughs> we, ignorance is worse than the poverty. We believe that digital literacy is essential for the future of Africa. Africa needs mm. skills of the future in order to be relevant and to be part of the digital economy. Because the new oil is data. We do not want to think like a third uh, industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is about data. To be able to understand that data science is digital literacy. Mm. We do not see, we do not want Africa to be called anymore number one exporter of oil, number one exporter of cocoa, number one exporter of coffee, but we want to see number one exporter of intellectual property because we can, we do have the manpower, the young people. So I access to, I, yes, the access to ICT quality education resource and systems in Africa is remain a challenge. Young students do not acquire skills needed to thrive in the actual rapid changing labor market. There is a need for innovation in the development, delivery, and implementation of education by taking advantage of the digital revolution. Without the digital literacy, I do, but I do not believe that we will be leapfrogging like we are dreaming. Right now, it is a dream. So education is the number one we should be focusing on because data is new oil, is no longer natural resources, which are finite. The new natural, new oil of the fourth industrial revolution is called data, which is infinite. That's what I have to say. Thank you. I love it. Thank you all gentlemen so, so much. So <laughs> for those of you watching, I mean, I have two pages of notes here. So I'm gonna try to give you a really quick summary of amazing things that, that our panel talked about today. One, talking about the fact that government is just key. We cannot ignore it from infrastructure to identification to democratizing the ability to, to incentivize the private sector to, to you know move all this technology and creating this enabling environment. So also the fact that we have different stages of people to ensure that people are not left behind. Artificial intelligence and other source technology will be really key in helping sure we close that digital divide. And also digital literacy, whether it's in the form of our local languages, to enable people um, to kind of come in and learn more. So that way, again, they're able to use that data to, to push us forward. Um, 
I'm going to finish up with a, with a quote again. Um, with, so it says, when, de when digital transformation is done right, it's like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. But when it's done wrong, all you have is a really fast caterpillar. And so... <laughs> 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 the focus here is that, again, this transformation is not just simply a switch that we turn on with the right amount invested. There's always ways to do it correctly, and there's ways to do it incorrectly. So everything we've talked about, education, enabling environment, being able to pull everyone along are all the things that are needed, right, to put it into this chrysalis to ensure that Africa is able to, to transform to that next level. So thank you gentlemen so much for your time today, for all the amazing nuggets of wisdom. And so back over to you guys and Tech Campus, really grateful for you guys joining me on this panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank have you. a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much and have a good day. Wonderful. Thank you.